Hey, hello, and welcome back to the AWS Startup Showcase. I'm John Furrier, your host. This is the Hero Panel, the AWS Heroes. These are folks that have a lot of experience in open source, having fun building great projects and commercializing the value and best practices of open source innovation. We've got some great guests here, Liz Wright, Liz Rice, Chief Open Source Officer, ISO Valen, CUBE alumni, great to see you. Brian Leroux, who's the co-founder and CTO of begin.com. Erica Windich, who's an architect for developer experience. AWS Hero, also a CUBE alumni. Casey Lee, CTO Gaggle, doing some great stuff in ed tech. Great collection of experts and experience, folks doing some fun stuff. Welcome to the, this conversation, this CUBE panel. Hi. Thanks for having us. Uh, Thanks for having us. Let's go down the line. I don't normally do this, but since we're remote and we have such great guests, go down the line and talk about why open source is important to you guys. What projects are you currently working on and what's the coolest thing going on there? Liz, we'll start with you. Okay, so I am very involved in the world of cloud native. Um, I'm the chair of the technical oversight committee for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So that means I get to see a lot of what's going on across a very broad range of cloud native projects. More specifically at Isovalent, I focus on Cilium, which is um, it, it's based on a technology called eBPF that is to me <laughs> probably the most exciting technology right now. And then finally, I'm also involved in an organization called Open UK, which is really pushing for more use of open technologies here in the United Kingdom. So uh, kind of spread around lots of different projects and I'm in a really fortunate position, I think, to see what's happening with lots of projects and, and also the commercialization of lots of projects. Awesome, Brian, what's, what's, what projects are you working on? Working on a project these days called Architect. It's an uh, open source project uh, built on top of AWS SAM. It adds uh, a lot of sugar and terseness to the SAM experience. It just makes it a lot easier to work with and get started. AWS can be a little bit intimidating to people at times and the open source community is uh, stepping up to make some of that uh, on-ramp a little bit easier. And I'm also an Apache member. And so I keep a hairy eyeball on what's going on in that reality all the time. And I've been doing this open source thing for quite a while, and uh, yeah, I love it. It's a, uh, it's a great thing. It's a, it's real science. We get to verify each other's work, and we get to, you know, expand and, and build on uh, human knowledge. So it's a huge honor to just even be able to do that, and I feel stoked to be here. So things are happening. Awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. Erica, what's your, what's your current situation going on here? What's happening? Sure. Um, so I am currently working on developer experience of a number of open source uh, SDKs um, and CLI uh, components uh, from my current employer. Um, and, you know, previously, um, recently I left New Relic where I was working on um, in integrating with open telemetry uh, as well as a number of other things. Uh, before that, I was uh, a maintainer of uh, Docker and of OpenStack. So I've been in this game for a while as well. Um, and I, I tend to just put my you know fingers in a lot of little pies, um, anywhere from you know DVD players, you know, 20 years ago to um, you know, a lot of this open telemetry and, you know, uh, monitoring and, you know, various SDKs and, you know, developer tools is kind of where, um, you know, like Docker and OpenStack and, you know, the SDKs that I work on now, um, you know, all very, very much, you know, focusing on developer as the user. Yeah, you're always on the wave, Kate. Uh, always on the wave, Erica, great stuff. Casey, uh, what's going on with you? You got some great ed tech that happening. What's happening with you? Yeah, sure. Um, the uh, primary open source project that I'm contributing to right now is ACT. This is a tool I created a couple years back when GitHub Actions first came out. And uh, my motivation there was uh, I'm just impatient and that whole commit, push, wait time where you're testing out your pipelines is painful. Uh, and so I wanted to build a tool that allowed developers to test out their GitHub Action workflows locally. And so this uh, tool um, uses Docker containers to emulate the GitHub Action environment and gives you fast feedback on those workflows that you're building. A um, lot, lot of uh, innovation happening at GitHub. And so we're just trying to keep up and continue to uh, replicate those new uh, features functionalities in the um, local runner. And the biggest challenge I've had with this project is just keeping up with uh, the community. Um, we just passed uh, 20,000 stars and there's, it'd be, it's, it's a, a normal week to get like 10 PRs. Um, so I, Super excited to announce um, just uh, yesterday, actually, I invited 
um, four of the most active contributors to, to help me with maintaining the project. And so this is kind of like a, a big deal for me, letting the project go and bringing other people in to help lead it. Um, so yeah, huge shout out, uh, shout out to um, those, those folks that have been helping um, with uh, driving that project. So looking forward to what's next for it. Great, we'll make sure the Silicon Angle writers catch that quote there, great call out. All right, let's start, Ron, you made me realize when you mentioned Apache and that you've been kind of watching all the stuff going on, brings up the question of the evolution of open source and the commercialization trends have been very interesting these days. You're seeing cloud scale um, really impact also with the growth of of code and, and Liz, if you remember, the Linux Foundation keeps making projections and they keep blowing past them every year on more and more code and more and more entrants coming in, not just individuals, corporations. So you're starting to see the, you know, Netflix donates some something, uh, you got, you know, Lyft donates some stuff, becomes a project, company forms around it. There's a lot of um, entrepreneurial activity that's creating this new abstraction layers, new platforms, not just tools. So you start to see kind of a, a new kick up uh, trajectory with open source. How, you guys want to comment on this because this is going to impact how fast the enterprise will see value here. I think a really great example of that is um, a project called Backstage that's just come out of Spotify and um, it's going through the incubation process at the CNCF and, and that's kind of why it's front of mind for me right now because I've been working on the due diligence for that. And the reason why I'm, I thought it was interesting in relation to your question is it's spun out of Spotify. It's fully open source. They have a ton of different enterprises using it as this developer portal, but they're starting to see some startups emerging, offering like a hosted managed version of Backstage or offering services around Backstage or offering commercial plugins into Backstage. And I think it's really fascinating to see those ecosystems building up around a project and um, different ways that people can, I'm a big believer you cannot sell the open source code, but you can sell other things that create value around open source projects. So that's really exciting to see. Great point, anyone else want to weigh in and react to that? Because it's the new model, it's not the old way. I mean, I remember when, when I was in college, we had the pirate software. It was not, there was open source wasn't around. It's like you had to <laughs> kind of deal under the table. Now it's free. But I mean, the old way was you had to convince the enterprise. Like you got to harden it, to build the community, and the community managed the quality of the code, and then you had to build the company to make sure they could support it. Now the companies are actually involved in it, right? And then new startups are in, are, are, are forming faster, and the proof points are shorter and highly accelerated for that, I mean, it's a whole new- It's a Cambrian explosion and it's it's great. Um, you know, it's one of those things that it, it's challenging for the new developers because they come in, they're like, whoa, what is all this stuff that I'm supposed to figure out? And there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. There's just tons of it. And I think that there's a desire for us to have one sort of like well-known trod happy path, but the reality is we're a lot better with a more diverse community with lots of options, with lots of ways to approach these problems. And I think it's just great. The challenge that we have with all these options and all these Cambrian explosion of projects and all these competing ideas, it's, uh, right now the sustainability is a bit of a tricky question to answer. We know that there's a commercialization aspect that helps us fund these projects, but how we compose the open versus the commercial source is still a bit of a tricky question and, and a tough one for a lot of folks. Erica, what, uh, uh, can you chime in on that for a second? I want to get your angle on that, this experience and all this code and I'm a new person, or I'm an existing person. Do I get like a blue check mm -hmm. mark, mark on verify? What's code? I mean, all, I mean, these are questions like, well, how do you navigate? Yeah, I, I think this has been something that's been happening for a while. Um, I mean, back in the early OpenStack days, you know, 2010, for instance, Rackspace, open sourcing, um, OpenStack and, uh, Anso Labs and so forth, and then trying, you know, having all these companies forming, a, you know, and creating startups around this. Um, you know, I started at a company called Cloud Scaling uh, back in late 2010, uh, and we had some competitors such as Piston and so forth, uh, where a lot of the Anso Labs people went. Um, but then, you know, the real winners, I think, from OpenStack ended up being the, the enterprises that jumped in. You know, we had uh, Red Hat in particular, as well as, um, you know, HP and uh, IBM, you know, jumping in and, and investing in OpenStack uh, and really proving out uh, a lot of, and not that it was the first time, 
but this is when we started seeing billions of dollars pouring into open source projects and open source foundations, such as the OpenStack Foundation, uh, which you know preceded a lot of the things that we now see with um, the Linux Foundation, uh, which was then created um, a little bit later. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I, I'm also reflecting a little bit on what Brian said because we're you know, there are projects that don't get funded, that don't get the same attention, but they're also getting used quite significantly. Um, you know, things like Log4j, um, you know, really bringing this, you know, to the spotlight in terms of projects that are used everywhere by everything with significant outsized impacts on the industry that are not getting funded, that, that you know, aren't flashy enough, that aren't exciting enough because it's just logging, but a vulnerability in it, um, you know, brings every, everything and everybody down and, you know, has, you know, possibly billions of dollars of, um, you know, impact to our industry uh, because nobody wanted to fund this project. I think that brings up the commercialization point about maybe bringing a venture capital model in and saying, hey, that boring little logging thing could be a key ingredient for say of some solving some observability problems. It's like, let's put some cash. Again, then we never seen that before. Now you're starting to see that uh, kind of uh, real smart investment thesis going into open source projects. I mean, Prometheus, Crafta, these are projects that turned up companies. These are, this is turning up companies. Um, and, a decade and, ago, there was no money in dev tools, but uh, I think that, that that's that been fully debunked now. Uh, there used to be a, a concept that the venture community believed, but there's just too much evidence to the contrary. Companies like HashiCorp, Datadog, this goes on and on. I think that the challenge for the open source comes back to um, foundations and working these uh, developers uh, make this code uh, safe and secure. Casey, what's your reaction to all of this? You got, so a project has gained some traction, um, got some momentum. Um, there's a lot of mission critical, I say, I won't say white spaces, but opportunities in, in the big cloud game happening. Um, and there's a lot of, I won't say too many, you know, entrepreneurial, but there's a lot of community action happening that's pre-commercialization that's getting getting traction. How does this all develop naturally and then vector in quickly when it hits? Yeah, I, I want to go back to the log4j topic real quick. I think that that's a it's a it's a great example of um, an a, 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 an area that we need to to do better at. And um, there there was a there was a cool article that Rob Pike wrote. Uh, describing how to quantify the criticality. I think that's what it, quantifying criticality was the, the article he wrote on how to, to use um, metrics to determine how valuable, how important a piece of open source is to the community. Uh, and, and we really need to highlight that more. We need a way to make it more clear how important this software is, how many people depend on it, how many people are um, contributing to it. And uh, because right now we all do that. Like if we're if I if I'm going to evaluate uh, an open source software, sure I'll look at how many stars it has and how many contributors it has. But I got to go through and do all that work myself and kind of come up with. It would be really great if we had an agreed upon method for ranking the the criticality of software, mm -hmm. but then also the risk. Hey, the, the, this is used by a ton of people, but nobody's contributing to it anymore. That that's a concern. And that would be great to potential users of that to signal whether or not it would make sense. The um, open, uh, open Source Security Foundation just getting off the ground. They're doing some work in this space, uh, and I'm I'm really excited to see where where they go with that. Looking well, at ways to score critical. Well, this brings up a good point. While we got everyone here, let's take a plug and plug a, a project you think that's not getting the visibility it needs. Let's go through each of you, point out a project that you think uh, people should be looking at and talking about that might um, get some free visibility here. Anyone want to highlight a project they think should be uh, uh, focused more on or, or that needs uh, a little bit of love? I, I think, I mean, particularly if we're talking about these sort of vulnerability issues, there's a ton of work going on like in the Secure Software Foundation, I, other foundations, I, I think there's work going on in Apache somewhere as well, around you know the bill of material, the software bill of materials, the secure supply, uh, software supply chain um, security. Even enumerating your dependencies is not trivial today. So I think there's going to be 
a ton of people doing really good work on that, as well as the criticality aspect. It's all um, like that. There's a really great XKCD cartoon with, you know, your software project and some really big monolithic lumps. And then, you know, this tiny little piece in a very important point that's, you know, maintained by somebody in his bedroom in Montana or something. And if you yeah, pulled you it out. You never know where the next lightning in a bottle comes from. And this is, I think the beauty of open source is that you get a little collaboration and you get three feet in a cloud of dust going and you get some momentum. Um, and if it's relevant, it rises to the top. And I think that's the, the collective intelligence of, of open source. Uh, the question I want to ask the, the, the panel here is, you know, when you go into an enterprise, uh, now that the, the game is changing where they're much more collaborative and involved, What's the story if they say, hey, what's in it for me? How do I manage the open source? What's the current best practice? Because there's no doubt I can't ignore it. It's in everything we do. How do I organize around it? How do I build around it to be um, more efficient and more productive and reduce the risk uh, on, on vulnerabilities to managing staff, making sure the right team's in place, um, the right agility, all those things. You called it. They, they got to get skin in the game. They, they, uh, they need to be active and involved and, uh, you know, donating to a sustainable open source project is a great way to start. But if you really want to you know, be active, then you should, you should be committing. You should have a goal for your organization to, to be uh, contributing back to that project. Maybe not committing code, could be, you know, committing resources into the docs or into tests or, you know, even, uh, tweeting about an open source project is contributing to it. And um, I think a lot of these enterprises um, could benefit a lot from getting more active with uh, the open source foundations that are out there. Liz, you've been actively involved. I know we've talked personally when the CNCF started, which had great commercial uptake from um, companies. Um, what do you think the current state of the art kind of equation is? Has it changed a little bit or is it the game still the same? Yeah, I mean, in the early days of the CNCF, it was very much um, dominated by vendors, you know, behind the project. And now we're seeing more and more membership from end user companies, the kind of enterprises that are, you know, building their businesses on cloud native, but their business is not in itself. Yeah. You know, that's not their, it, the infrastructure is not their business. And I think seeing those companies putting money in, putting time in, yeah. as Brian says, you know, contributing resources. Quite often there's enough money, but finding the talent to do the work and finding people who are prepared to actually, you know, chop the wood and carry the water. Exactly. That, it, it's hard. And if enterprises can find people, you know, to spend time on open source projects, help with those chores. Yeah. It's hugely valuable. And it it's one of those, you know, the rising tide floats all the boats. We can raise security, we can raise um the, the you know, reduce the amount of um dependency on unmaintained projects yeah. collectively. Yeah. I think the business model is there. I think one of the things I'll uh, I'll, re I'll react to and then get your guys' comments is remember which KubeCon it was, it was one of the early ones, and I remember seeing Apple and having a booth, but nobody was manning, it was just an Apple booth. They weren't doing anything, but they were recruiting. And I think you saw the transition of a business model where the worry about a big vendor taking over a project and having undue influence over it kind of goes away because I think this idea of participation is also talent, but also committing that talent back, right? Into the communities as a model, as a business model, like, okay, hire some great people, but you know, listen, let's don't, don't screw over the open source piece of it because that's critical. Also hire a channel, right? They, they can use those contributions to uh, source that talent and build the reputation in the communities that they depend on. And so there's really a, a, a lot of benefit to the large organizations that can do this. They'll have a huge pipeline of uh, really qualified engineers right out the gate without having to resort to cheesy whiteboard interviews, which is pretty great. Yeah. You can see I, the code. I, I, yeah. I, I agree with a lot of this. Um, I, one of my concerns is that a lot of these corporations tend to focus very narrowly on certain projects, um, which, you know, they feel that they depend greatly. You know, they'll invest in OpenStack, they'll invest in Docker, they'll invest in, you know, some of the CNCF projects, and then these other projects, you know, kind of get ignored. Um, something that I've been a proponent of for a little bit of, for well, a while is, observability of your dependencies. Um, and I, I don't think there's quite enough 
um, projects and, and you know solutions to this. And, and it sounds uh, maybe from Liz, there are some projects that I don't know about. Um, but I also know that there's you know some startups like Sneak and so forth that you know help with a little bit of this uh, problem. But I, I think we need more focus um, on some of these edges, and I think companies need to do better um, both in you know providing you know having some sort of solution for observability of their dependencies as well as um, understanding those dependencies and managing them um, and, you know I've seen companies for instance depending on software that they actively don't want to use based on you know certain criteria that they've already set um, you know projects you know like they'll, they'll set a um, requirement that any project that they use you know has a code of conduct um, but they'll then use projects that don't have codes of conduct. Um, and if they don't have a code of conduct, then employees are prohibited from working on those projects. So you, you've locked yourself into a, a place where you're depending on software that yeah. you have instructed your employees are not allowed to contribute to for, for you know, certain legal and, and you know, other reasons. Um, so so you, know, you, you need to draw a line in the sand and then recognize that those projects are ones that you don't wanna consume um, and then not use them. Um, and have observability around these things. That's a great point. I think one of, we have 10 minutes left. I want to just shift to a topic that I think is relevant and that is as open source software, it's software, people develop software. You see under the hood kind of software, SREs uh, developing very quickly in the cloud scale, but also you got your, you know, your classic software developers who are writing code. So you have supply chain, software supply chain challenges. You mentioned uh, developer experience around um, how to code, you have now automation in place. So you've got the development of, you know, all these things that are happening. Like, I just want to write software. So I want, some people want to get and do infrastructure as code. So DevSecOps is here. So how does that look like uh, going forward? How is the future of open source going to make the developers just want to code, code quickly? And the folks who want to tweak the infrastructure a bit, more efficient. Any views on that? Uh, at, at Gaggle, we're using AWS's CDK exclusively for our infrastructure as code. Uh, and it, it's a great uh, transition for developers. Instead of writing uh, YAML or JSON or even HCL for their infrastructure code, now they're writing code in the language that they're used to, Python or JavaScript. Uh, and what, that, what that's providing is uh, a, an easier transition for developers into that infrastructure as code at Gaggle here, uh, but it's also providing an opportunity to provide reusable constructs that uh, some devs can build on. So if, if we've got a very opinionated way to deploy a serverless app and a database and do auto scaling behind it and all this stuff, we can, expose, we can pr pr uh, present that to a developer as a library and they can just consume it as is. And maybe that's as deep as they want to go yeah. and they're happy with that. But then uh, they want to they go deeper into it they can either use some of the lower level constructs or create PRs to the platform team to have those constructs change to fit their needs. So it provides a nice on-ramp developers to, to use the, the tools and, and, and languages they're used to, um, and then also go deeper as they need. That's awesome. Does that mean they're not full stack developers anymore? That they're half stack developers? That you're already taking care of for them? <laughs> I'm only kidding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, anyway, any other reactions to this mm -hmm. whole, uh, I just want to code, make it yeah. easy for me, and some people want to get down and dirty under the hood. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that um, for, for me, Docker was always you know a, a key part of this. Um, you know, I don't know when DevSecOps was coined exactly, but um, you know, I. I uh, was talking with people about it, you know, uh, back in 2012. Um, and when I joined Docker, it was a part of that vision for me was that Docker was applying these security principles by default for your application. It wasn't, I mean, yes, everybody adopted because of the portability and, you know, the acceleration of development, but it was for me, the fact that it was you know, limiting what you could do from a security angle by default, and then giving you these tunables that you can control it further. Um, you, you asked about a project that may not get enough recognition. Uh, it's something called Docker Slim, which um, is designed to optimize your containers and will make them smaller, but it, it also constrains the security footprint and will remove capabilities from the container. Uh, it will help you build um, security profiles for App Armor uh, and um, uh, the, the Red Hat one, uh, uh, SE Linux. SE Linux. Um, yeah. <laughs> and 
Um, you know, this is something that I think a lot of developers, you know, it's kind of outside of the realm of things that they're really thinking about. Yeah. Um, so the more that we can automate those processes and make it easier and out of the box for users or for, you know, when I say users, I mean developers, um, you know, so that it's straightforward um, and automatic um, and also giving them the capability of the, you know, refining it and tuning it as needed uh, or simply choosing platforms like, you know, serverless offerings, which have these security constraints built in out of the box um, and sometimes maybe less tunable, but, um, you know, very strong by default. Um, and I think that's, you know, a good place for us to be is where you, we, we just enforce these things and, and, and make you, do, do things you know in a secure way yeah i mean i'm a huge fan of kubernetes but it's not the right hammer for every you know nail and there are absolutely tons of applications that are better served by something like lambda where a lot more of that security surface is taken care of for the developer and i think we will see um better tooling around, you know, security profiling and making it easier to kind of shrink wrap your applications that, you know, there are plenty of products out there that can help you with this in a, in a cloud native environment. But I think for the, the smaller developer, let's say, or an earlier stage company, yeah, it needs to be so much more straightforward, really does. We're in an interesting time. Uh, 10 years ago, when I was working at Adobe, uh, we used to requisition all these um, analysts to tell us how many developers there were for the market. And we thought there was about 20 million developers. And if <laughs> GitHub's to be believed, we think there's now around 80 million developers. So both these groups are probably wrong in their numbers, but yeah. the takeaway here for me is that we, we've got a lot of new developers. Yeah. And a lot of these new developers, uh, are really struck by a paradox of choice. And they're typically starting in the front end. And so there's a lot of movement in the stack to move towards the front end. We saw that at reInvent when Amazon was really pushing Amplify because um, they're, they're seeing this too. It's interesting because this is where folks start. And so a lot of the abstractions are moving in that direction, but maybe not always necessarily totally appropriate. And so finding the right balance for folks um, is, is still a work in progress. Like Lambda is a great example. It lets me focus totally on just business logic. I don't have to think about infrastructure pretty much at all. And if I'm newer to the industry, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, as use cases expand, all of a sudden, you know, reality intervenes and it might not be appropriate for everything. And so figuring out what those edges are is still the, the challenge, I think. All right, thank you very much for coming on the Cube here panel, AWS Heroes. Thanks everyone for coming on, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me. Okay, that's a wrap here. Back to the program and the awesome startups. Thanks for watching.